So, um, on our topic, the Bolsheviks in power, this topic is of most importance to revolutionary communists. We are building a world party of uh, revolution because we want to lead the working class to power and we want uh, the working class to retain this power, overthrow capitalism globally and build a communist society. And that is why we are committed to studying the experience of Bolshevism in power. In the span of a few uh, short years, the Bolsheviks went from a party that had been decimated by reaction to a shining beacon uh, to the revolutionary masses across the world. Despite the invasion of 21 foreign armies, they won uh, the, the desperate battle for survival, whilst making huge strides for the working class, founding the first free health uh, service, legalizing divorce and abortion, decriminalizing um, homosexuality, and so on. This talk will cover the early uh, USSR, the period of the Civil War, and the urgent tasks of a successful revolution faces. Our, sp our speaker today will be Rob Sewell. He is the leading comrade of the Revolutionary Communist Party in Britain and editor of the party's paper, uh, The Communist. He is also the author of a book uh, recently published by our international, In Defense of Lenin. I recommend all comrades to read this book, to study it, to arm yourselves um, for the struggles ahead of us. So without further delay, um, I hand over to Rob. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, comrades, good morning. When I was asked to uh, speak on this subject, I kind of smiled, first of all, because um, it's such a vast subject to cover in one talk. After all, Victor Serge wrote a book, Year One of the Revolution, a whole book just on one year. And we're going to try and cover a period of what, something like five years. Clearly, when we, when we talk about this subject, we're talking about the, uh, the regime under Lenin and Trotsky. We are certainly aware that the Russian Revolution was the greatest event in history, as it put the working class into power for the first time. Of course, this is a very heroic period, I would say. Uh, as the chair said, one of uh, colossal inspiration, of, of, of hope, but also of enormous uh, sacrifice. Of course, the, uh, the bourgeois historians, if you can call them historians, have attempted to, to de denigrate the whole revolution and this particular period as well. And therefore, our task is to reveal the, the real truth uh, and, and the enormous difficulties, is true, that faced the, the Bolshevik party. As uh, Rosa Luxemburg said, you know, the Bolshevik dead, they dead. And they translated the ideas and aspirations of socialism into practice. But the, uh, the victory in Russia presented uh, the Bolshevik leaders with enormous uh, problems and difficulties from the, from the word go. After all, if you were going to choose a country in the world where you're going to carry out a socialist revolution, probably the last country you would have picked would be Russia because of the enormous backwardness of the country. The industrial working class numbered about 3 million. The working class as a whole, probably 10 million. And the peasantry numbered 150 million. 70% of the population could not read or write. And certainly the uh, material basis for a class society did not exist in any shape or form. That is why Lenin and the Bolsheviks always had an internationalist perspective the revolution was simply the opening shot of the world revolution, nothing more. Because what it did provide, the victory did provide, that uh, the Soviet Republic was now the citadel of world revolution. Of course, the Soviet Republic was born out of the revolution in October, where you could say it was a, a, quite a remarkable, uh, quick overturn. I think uh, it, it was uh, Isaac Deutscher who said that, uh, well, the provisional government was just given a bit of a nudge and, and fell. And of course, the victory in Russia also gave uh, illusions that this was going to be a, a quick victory everywhere. I know Trotsky had the idea that uh, once they had taken power, that he would um, retire and write some books. Of course, it didn't uh, work out that way. And what they realized in the, in the years that followed that the uh, question of revolution was, was quite complex, more, more complex than they had anticipated. Of course, when they first came to power, uh, the uh, bourgeois strategists and, and the ruling classes had the opinion that uh, the revolution wouldn't last. You know, they'll, they'll be out of power in a few days or a few weeks, it wouldn't last. And that they, they put their uh, uh, hope, the bourgeoisie put their hope in the victory, as they saw it, of the Germans or the British. But from the word go, 
you could describe the situation in Lenin's words that the revolution was in a besieged fortress. And it, it was a, a new venture. After all, the working class had briefly come to power in the Paris Commune, but that was a short period. There was no books laid down of what to do. They had a broad outline, but they had to fill in a lot of the, uh, the blanks. And above all, uh, the question of the survival of the revolution was uppermost in the minds of the Bolshevik leaders. Soon after the victory, Lenin put forward a whole series of decrees. And uh, the reason for the number of decrees was he was not sure how long the regime would last. And it was a question of putting down a marker for future generations. Of course, um, they'd come to power on the basis of, of the slogans, all power of the Soviets, which had been achieved. They were now establishing a Soviet Republic where the working class held power together with the, the peasants. But they also promised bread, land, and peace. So one of the first decrees, the first decree was on peace. And they offered all the belligerent powers uh, an immediate cessation of hostilities, a peace without annexations or indemnities. And that was, and that was broad, broadcast to the world. But the reaction of the, of the Allies was to threaten the Bolshevik regime, that they must not leave the war. In relation to uh, land, that was a vital question, because they had to win the support of the majority of, of peasants to the revolution. The original idea of the Bolsheviks that is, is, is what they would nationalize the land, take over the land, but they would introduce a, a system of um, collective farms, basically. But um, the peasants were eager for the land, and Lenin being a, a pragmatist, a, a realist, given that the peasant Soviet had come out for direct la land to the peasants, he adopted that program, which was in reality the program of the, of the social revolutionaries. In fact, they accused him of stealing their program. They were a bit annoyed. But Lenin shrugged his shoulders. He says, well, yes, I've stolen your program, but so what? And that, that message per percolated down throughout uh, Russia. Because there are other decrees on the national question or of the right of nations of self-determination. Or another decree on workers' control was introduced. But there's a whole host of them uh, put, it, put on the statute books. But the, the revolution immediately faced a crisis. <clears throat> In effect, the sabotage by uh, former government officials and, and uh, civil servants. <clears throat> the, uh, the telephone exchange workers went on strike. And uh, this, this served to paralyze the, 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 the Bolsheviks at that stage. They would, uh, Trotsky would turn up at the, uh, uh, the com as he called it, the com they changed the name. And rather than minister, they now became commissars to differentiate themselves from the old, old regime. And when Trotsky turned up to the Commissar of Foreign Affairs, the, the door was locked, he couldn't get in. Uh, Kollontai, actually with tears streaming down her face, arrested some workers to get the keys off them. So they had to, had to improvise a lot. Uh, workers were drawn into the, to, uh, to take charge of the telephones. They didn't know how to operate them. They had to learn very quickly. And also we had, we had the threat from the, the Railway Workers Union. And the reason for this is that um, the revolution moves very quickly, but the apparatus of the unions is, is a very slow-moving process. <clears throat> and therefore the Bolsheviks didn't have the time to win over these unions before the revolution broke out. <clears throat> so the Railway Workers' Union was under the control of the Mensheviks, and they demanded a coalition government. They, they, they threatened a general strike unless a coalition government was introduced. <clears throat> then there was a coalition with those, party, those parties who opposed the revolution. Uh, the, the, the Bolsheviks were forced into negotiations, but the, the railway workers' leaders were saying, no, the, the government must exclude Lenin and Trotsky. And this led to a crisis within the Bolshevik government and in the Bolshevik party at the top. If you remember, that uh, Kamenev and Zinoviev had, op had opposed the insurrection earlier. Now these, with a few others, were in favour of a coalition government and in favour of Lenin and Trotsky standing down if necessary. But eventually these, these negotiations broke down and uh, they managed, the Bolsheviks managed to hold the line, if you like. But they were in favor of a coalition government with the left social revolutionaries who were reluctant to enter the government at this point. But after this crisis, they agreed to form a coalition with the Bolsheviks. You have also this problem that arose of the Constituent Assembly. This this demand had long been in the program of the Bolshevik party. But of course, uh, 
A new power had arisen now after the revolution, the Soviet power. Lenin himself was in favour of postponing elections to the Constituent Assembly in order to give time for the peasants to absorb the gains of the revolution and also to update the electoral lists which were out of date. But Lenin actually found himself in a minority, which you'll find on, on a number of occasions this is the case. So much for the uh, bourgeois idea that uh, Lenin was dominating the party and, and with an iron fist, which is nonsense. All Lenin had was a political authority, nothing more than that, which he had built up. But he was in a minority, so they went ahead with the elections to the Constituent Assembly. As I explained, the list throughout the date. The Social Revolutionary Party had split between the right wing and the left wing, which obviously wasn't taken account of. But as we know, uh, the result of the elections were that the Bolsheviks, although they won a majority in, in the cities, didn't win a majority overall. overall. Interestingly enough, because they talk about uh, you know, the oppression of the, of, of, the, of the Bolsheviks, the bourgeois cadet party stood in these elections and won seats. But it was quite clear when this assembly met they, and refused to endorse the decrees of the Soviet government, uh, the question of, arose of dissolving the constituent assembly. Because such an assembly with a, a counter-revolutionary majority could only act as a, a catalyst for the counter-revolution. So it existed for, I think, 12 hours, and it was dismissed. And um, no one said anything about it. It didn't uh, create a fuss or anything, which goes to show how, how little authority it had at that time. Of course, the, the key question facing the, the government also was the question of the war. So they entered into negotiations with the Germans because the other powers weren't prepared to, to, to enter any negotiations. And uh, eventually, uh, Trotsky, who was the foreign minister, was put in charge of these negotiations. And the Bolsheviks obviously were, were keen to spread the revolution, particularly to Germany. And there had been strikes in Germany in January 1918, by the way. And Trotsky used the negotiations to, to make an appeal over the heads of the negotiations to the masses outside, and particularly to the German workers. I mean... The, Ger the German generals who were present at the negotiations were quite, quite uh, horrified by what was going on. Even Radek turned up with a bunch of uh, uh, leaflets, distributing them to the uh, soldiers, the German soldiers, urging revolution. But of course, the Soviet government was at a complete disadvantage at this time. The, uh, the army had uh, disintegrated, the traditional army had, had collapsed. The Germans had advanced all the way through uh, Ukraine. Um, so it was a gamble, if you like, in an attempt to, to spread the revolution, using this platform to spread the revolution. And it gave rise to a, um, quite a conflict within inside the, the leadership of the Bolshevik party of what to do. Again, um, it was led by uh, Bukharin, which is the demand for a that the Bolsheviks, we should, the, the government should, should conduct a revolutionary war against the Germans and, and Western capitalism which was the kind of traditional position, you know, if all things being equal, if they had the, a big red army, they would, they would have used it. But at that, that point, it was a crazy idea because there was no army to fight. And yet the support for revolutionary war gained the majority at that time. Both Lenin and Trotsky were against this, uh, this adventure. Even some of the, the Soviets were in favor because it was such an easy victory in October. They were carried away by what they could do. And although uh, Trotsky and Lenin were against the Revolutionary War, uh, Trotsky's position was they should try and extend the negotiations, try, try and uh, cause revolution in, in Germany. But Lenin's position was, look, I think we should sign, sign now. I don't think we'd risk anything. And led to, to a whole series of meetings, of discussions, of votes and so on throughout this period, zigzagging between one position and another. But in the end, uh, the German imperialists discounted anything and, and began to advance, make further advances and demands as far as they were concerned. Eventually it led, led to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which was a, a real uh, terrible treaty as far as the Bolsheviks were concerned, uh, because, the Russian, because the Germans took huge swathes of uh, Russian territory. But uh, Lenin and Trotsky understood that the regime was hanging by a thread. They had to make concessions just to hold on. 
The uh, period prior to this, again, this, this whole period, is, it's like a, a roller coaster of events. I mean, we take go a few weeks earlier, and the revolution had been threatened by, by a counter-revolution from uh, General Krasnov. The workers were, were, were if you like, it's, uh, this period of the revolution, it was one of great leniency, illusions in leniency. After all, the, the provisional government had been arrested, but then they were released. Kerensky went out to uh, the outskirts of Petrograd and linked up with General Krasnov, and they then marched on Petrograd to overthrow the Bolsheviks. But they were, were met by uh, Red Guards and, and the general thrust of the population, which event, eventually led to the mutiny in the counter-revolutionary army, and Krasnov was handed over to the Bolsheviks. But instead of uh, putting Krasnov against the wall and, and shooting him, which should have been the case, they asked him to write a, a promissory note that he would not take up arms and he'd be very peaceful and very nice. Of course, after signing that, he immediately bolted to the south and organized the, the, uh, the volunteer army in the south. The same was true of, of, of Kornilov and a whole series of, uh, of generals who began to organize the, the, the Cossacks and so on and the elements of counter-revolution in, in the south. When Lenin heard that uh, they had just abolished the, the death penalty, he hit the roof. He thought, what the hell are you playing at? You know, we are faced with a life and death struggle here and you can't, uh, you know, uh, threaten the en enemy uh, by just putting them in jail. But the, but the whole uh, situation at this time was, was very laxed. In fact, the, one of the agents, Bruce Lockhart, was a, a British agent in uh, Moscow at this time and in Petrograd. And he writes in his memoirs how he was able to travel anywhere he wanted to, uh, and go into the, the, the French consulate with all the other counter-revolutionaries to organize conspiracies. So, 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 so he had quite f freedom, if you like, for the counter-revolution, quite considerable. Also, the economy was in the hands of the, of the capitalist class. Apart from nationalizing the banks and a few small industries, important, the economy was left in private hands. And the reason for this was that the, the working class was such a small minority, they had to learn how to manage industry. And uh, Lenin hoped that on the basis of workers' control in these factories, the workers would gain this experience and eventually they would be taken over into public ownership. But of course, the, uh, the Employers' Federation said any attempt to introduce workers' control will be met by, by the shutting down of, of the factories. So, it's, it, so you see, all this period is a period of sabotage of the economy. And the original idea that Lenin had, they'd, they'd have a breathing space in order to, to uh, prepare the way forward was completely lost. It was just not, not going to happen. In other words, there was no respite. And what was to come was, uh, was with the example that was given in, in, in Finland, when the workers rose up in Finland with a general strike and an insurrection. They were put down in, in cold blood using the, the German troops. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk meant that the Russian troops had to withdraw, so they were left defenseless. And something in the order of 100,000 Finnish workers were either uh, killed or, or, or injured you know, in, the, in the battles. It was a bloodbath. And that was, that was, the, that was the first warning of what the, the, the ruling class were preparing for the Russian workers. But it, and, and by the summer of 1918, given the widespread sabotage of the economy, uh, decrees were carried out to nationalize entire economy practically, which was uh, a big step. They didn't want to take it, they were pushed into doing this. And there were various experiments, it must be said, about workers' control, it's true. But uh, it was a bit chaotic with one industry not coordinating with another industry, comp competing over raw materials, all sorts of things were happening. Above all, you had the development of the civil war, the beginnings of civil war now, in a serious way. And in order to feed the cities, it was important to, um, the only thing they could do was to requisition grain from the countryside. Trotsky was uh, uh, moved from the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs to the, became the, the, the Minister of War. And his task was to build up a red army, a powerful red army. There were 100,000 volunteers, but that was not sufficient. They needed millions 
in order to combat the threat now from imperialism. And this led also to another dispute in uh, another yeah, argument over how, what form the, the, the army should take and so on. And you had uh, what you might describe as, as the left communists emerging, mainly about, again around Bukharin, who by the way, in his opposition to the brest Treaty, organized a, a, a daily paper against the, the, the Bolsheviks. And this was allowed because the, the party was so large, you're talking about hundreds of thousands they needed to get to, only through such a medium would they be able to see the news and see the different positions. But, but uh, Bukharin in particular and the left communists were a, a thorn in the side of the, of the Soviet government for many years. They, they, they were against the professionalization, if you like, of, of industry, of trying to, to reorganize industry on a proper basis which meant, uh, in reality, the introduction of one-man management in order to pull things together. And in the, in the army, the idea was, oh, and all we need is, is militias, red guards, you know? In other words, a very unprofessional kind of means of defense. This became known as the Tsaritsyn opposition, because Trotsky's view was, if you're gonna build an army of professionals, you need to take the talent of the old uh, uh, army elite, if you like, the generals, and bring that into, into, uh, into the practice of a new Red Army. <coughs> Which is just like in industry, you need technicians, you need you know, people who have the know-how to run industry, you need, you need to have the know-how of how to wage a war. And one exchange, and one exchange between Lenin and Trotsky, Trotsky, because Lenin said, well, how many of these generals do we have now in the Red Army? He said, we've got about 30,000. Of course, there were dangers involved in this, you know, you know, having people who would run the old army to come and help out in the new army. So they put a series of, of commissars. Each general, each officer was assigned a commissar, a political commissar, to oversee these people. And of course, some of these generals did betray, there's no doubt about that. But quite a, a large number did help the cause of the, of the work estate and defending the work estate. The, uh, in fact, it was Stalin who later uh, rose to uh, prominence, actually based himself on this opposition to Trotsky in the armed forces. But we'll deal with that in a minute, hopefully. Um, but the requisitioning which took place uh, began to obviously alienate particularly the, the middle peasants, you know. And they, they began to complain. They, they began to, to oppose opposition now to the, to the government because of the requisitioning. But the government had no alternative because of the lack of grain for the cities. And the amount of, of rationing was introduced and the amount of bre bread rations became, decreased because of the scarcities. But in Ju July 1918, this led to the social, left social revolutionaries breaking with the government, resigning from the government. In fact, they began to carry out a, uh, um, uh, measures against the government, even conducting uh, individual terrorism against members of the government. They were against the brest Treaty, for instance. They wanted war with Germany, so they murdered the uh, German ambassador, Mirbach. Um, and then uh, in, April, in, in August 1918, there was an, a, an assassination attempt against Lenin by, by a uh, left social revolutionary. Lenin was leaving a factory and he was approached and shot, and, and the bullets actually remained in him permanently, or they took, managed to take one out anyway later on. There was an attempt to blow up Trotsky's train as well at that time. So this uh, resulted in a huge change now, this, this uh, attempt to murder the leadership of the Bolshevik party and the intensification of the, um, of the civil war. And by this time in, in August, the British had landed troops in uh, uh, Archangel and Mamansk together with uh, Canadians and Americans. Japanese troops, troops also in, in Vladivostok and, and come up through the Crimea. And uh, in effect, the, 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 it was a full-fledged now invasion by the imperialists of, of uh, Soviet Russia. The white, uh, the white armies uh, you know, of, of the counter-revolution were financed by the imperialists and armed by the imperialists. They were also in league with, with the Germans who had occupied uh, um, uh, the Ukraine. So therefore... You had what was called the beginning of, of, uh, of the Red Terror, of the, of the counter, of the revolution defending itself. And uh, this opened up a new phase, if you like, where in a matter of months, given the invasion of, of 21 foreign armies, it resulted in the, in the blockade of Russia, 
large areas which were or, or occupied now, which had previously grown wheat and food and important in, in, um, materials when, which are needed for industry. So they were, they were in a very desperate situation, to say the least. In March 1918, you know that they launched the appeal for the Third International. This was, this was on the back of the defeat of the German Revolution, which had happened in, in, in November, December 1918. So, the, so with the, uh, the organization of the Commerce International, and the, they generated support internationally for the Russian Revolution, but internally, they were fighting for their lives. 1919 was probably the most critical year for them. I mean, you could have a whole discussion about the, the Civil War, where you had the, the, the fronts moved, you know, dramatically in one direction and another. Obviously, there was enormous discontent in the peasantry, although they did support the Bolsheviks because they still had the land. And if the whites conquered that area, they would give land back to the, to the landlords. In Russia at the time, you also had what it was called the, the Czech Legion, which is a an army of 40,000 which was left behind after the, after the war. They took over the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway. They were financed by imp the imperialists, of course. And they linked up in a kind of pincer movement in order to, to, to take Petrograd and Moscow. Uh, I mean, there's a whole, a whole uh, discussion you can have on, on the, the way in which the, the Red Army operated. But you're probably aware that Trotsky organized his... Uh, his campaign on a, on a train, on a military train, which was not an ordinary train, but was, had enormous facilities on it for, for propaganda, agitprop, everything you think of was, was loaded on this train, which, which circumvented the, uh, the fronts. Of course, there was uh, quite a lot of desertion from either side, but uh, Trotsky used to, Trotsky used to uh, get the deserters all together in a mass meeting and appeal to them. This is your, your last chance to become heroes of the revolution and not betrayers and convince them politically to return to the ranks. I haven't got the figures in front of me, but I know that uh, the amount of traveling, he kind of, it, with the equivalent of circumventing the world, I think about five times. Basically, he was on this train for years, you know. He just kept on going from one front to another to, to, to boost the, the support for the revolution. And if it wasn't for the support of the imperialist countries, the civil war would have ended a long time ago. The, the white armies would have been defeated quite quickly. So when they talk about bloodshed, they are responsible for the bloodshed of the civil war. The revolution was bloodless. It's a civil war where the deaths were accumulated. So we have this, this uh, military, the militarization of the whole economy, which is called war communism. Everything was directed towards the war and survival. But I don't think you, you can imagine the difficulties that they faced on all fronts. Industrial production had just collapsed under these circumstances. The towns and cities were hun not just hungry, they were starving. By 1920, Lenin was always a, a realist. You know, he didn't, didn't uh, hide the facts, didn't hide things. He, he told the truth all the time. He says, we've reached a situation where the working class, which is very, very small, is becoming declassed. They were, they were basically fainting at the machines, you know, through hu hunger, they were, f they were f just uh, too weak to stand. So many of them fle fled to the countryside in order to get some food. About 1920, half the population of Moscow and half the population of Petrograd had disappeared. It was just a simply a, a battle to survive, nothing more. Even in, in, in the factories, workers would, would uh, will set, sell off machines and scrap metal in order to get something to eat. So, and, the, and the left communists were talking about workers' control and so on. How the hell could you have workers' control under those kind of conditions? The Soviets itself, they didn't collapse, they just kind of withered at this time. I mean, the working class, which is a small class at the was stretched. I mean, the Soviet Union covers what? One sixth of the world's surface. This is who you're talking about. And, and many of the best uh, uh, Bolsheviks and fighters from Petrograd, they, they volunteered for the front. For instance, Kron Kronstadt was completely de denuded. As they, as they sent the, the courageous sailors, yes, to all fronts in order to defend the revolution. And of course, many of them were, were, were killed. 
and, 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 and quite a lot were trying to absorb into the state apparatus. They, they were trying to organize the state. But as we, as we know, because the, 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 the terrible illiteracy, the Soviet state had to rely upon the old czarist officials and so we could read and write after all, in order to keep the administration going. And given this, uh, this, 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 these objective conditions, the scarcity, the, the, the hunger and so on, all that had a major impact on, in, in, in the revolution. And we had, we have a growing bureaucracy developing within the state apparatus and, 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 and later in the party. Of course, uh, Lenin had come forward with, with uh, um, a policy to try and prevent bureaucracy or limit bureaucracy. In the famous points, you know, the election of all officials, you know, the, the right of recall, an armed people, no separate, but an armed people, that was the general idea. Um, uh, yeah, what I say, that no official received more than a skilled worker, I don't know if I mentioned that, but also a rotation, as much as supervision and rotation of functions. But of course, uh, uh, with material deficiencies, with their actual def def you know, deficient material human resources, then that was also very difficult to, to maintain. Although, as you said, in relation to the government, I mean, they had a, a rule um, that uh, in relation to wages differentiation, that no one should earn more than double two to one ratio. That developed into a four to one ratio. But of course, uh, the most skilled workers and so on, and, and, the, and the specialists were paid far, far higher rates to prevent them just going to the West. But the whole idea was that and all the government, had, had, again, were on, on the same low wages as skilled workers. But of course, the, uh, this uh, situation, this, this terrible objective situation, uh, could only be resolved on the basis of a world revolution. You know, they were, Lenin believed that, they, 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 that uh, without a revolution in, in Germany or the West, they would be defeated. They would be doomed. They couldn't survive. So everything was, was based upon the world revolution. They would, they would hold on as long as they could using the most desperate measures but above all, prepare. And therefore, you had the, the Communist International, meetings of the Communist International every year. But what's, what saved the, uh, the Soviet Republic was the international solidarity also of the working class. The Bolsheviks made a class appeal to the, to the, to the foreign troops. I think it was Arthur Ranson, who was, became, who was a very famous writer of children's books later. Was cap he was in Russia and was really captivated by the revolution. And the... the together with uh, uh, other uh, uh, English speakers, wrote um, appeals to the workers of the West to support the revolution. And this had a, 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 big, a big impact. I know we, you know, the longshoremen in the United States went on strike. In L London, you had the, the uh, strike of the workers on the, uh, of the, on the Jolly George ship, refusing to, uh, uh, to load munitions. Uh, eventually, because of the, the heat of the revolution and the feelings back home, the soldiers, the imperialist interventions began to crumble. And, and by the beginning of 1920, you had basically the imperialist powers decide to withdraw. They can't, they can't sustain it. So once they withdraw, the white armies collapse, left, right and centre. By this time, the Red Army numbers five million people and was completely victorious on all fronts, apart from, I think, the Crimea at that point. And that, Lenin believed, was, was now providing them with a respite, another respite, possible respite. But of course, uh, that didn't last too long. Uh, the Poles invaded, the, po the, po uh, the Polish regime decided to invade, and um, they advanced quite far, but then we were counter, at the counter-offensive of the Red Army. And by this time, the Red Army then drove the Poles back right up to the gates of Warsaw. Uh, I think Lenin in particular was in favor of carrying it through or to an end. But, but Trotsky was, uh, uh, was against it. He thought the, the supply lines were stretched too much and, and it wouldn't, su wouldn't succeed. So, the, so they had to, to, to retreat, basically. But uh, the, the dissatisfaction that had emerged in the peasantry during this civil war had reached boiling point. And so he had, he had 
a series of uh, peasant uh, mu uh, uprisings in, uh, in Tambov and other regions. And this also reflected itself in the, in the, in the mutiny in Kronstadt in 1921, where the Kronstadt uh, mutineers seized the um, military base, put for the idea of um, Soviets without communists. Uh, and their program also reflected the discontent of the peasantry, the need for free market in, in grain, for instance, they argued for. Now, Kronstadt had fundamentally changed since 1917. It was a, a Bolshevik stronghold, but those Bolsheviks uh, went uh, in all parts of uh, Russia to defend the revolution. And they'd been replaced by, by peasant troops, usually from the Ukraine, actually. And they were open. They were open to counter-revolutionary propaganda because they're discontent in the peasantry. And this opened up a very dangerous scenario for the revolution because uh, of the proximity of, of Kronstadt uh, to Petrograd. The sea was frozen, but uh, very shortly that sea was going to open up. It was going to... And the imperialist navies, after all, they were involved in this plot as well to overthrow the government. They were planning to use that as a means to, uh, an of another offensive against the Soviet Union. The, uh, the Kronstadt uh, rebellion took, was take, took place at the time of the 20th uh, Congress of the Communist Party. Sorry, Tet. I'm getting confused with Khrushchev. Pardon me. <laughs> Tenth. And it was at the, the 10th Congress, of course, where many of the delegates volunteered to fight uh, in, in, to put down the insurrection, including members of the, of the workers' opposition joined the fight against the uh, Kronstadt mutineers. But uh, obviously I haven't got time to fill in all the, the different developments. That's impossible. Uh, and and comrades are well aware that um, the uh, parties, the social revolutionaries, the Mensheviks and so on, went over to the counter-revolution uh, initially. And therefore, they went into, if not uh, uh, clandestine conditions, semi-clandestine conditions, I suppose you'd say. But even then, they produced in newspapers, quite ironically, the social revolutionary, anarchists, and, and uh, produced newspapers. Uh, so they were tolerated, if you like. But the, the regime was in, in a very critical state by 1921. Although the, the, the civil war was ended, it still was in a very critical condition. There had to be a change in policy to appease the peasantry, which was in a state of absolute revolt. Because the regime rested upon a unity between the, the workers and the peasants. And therefore, they put forward a policy called the new economic policy. Requisitioning would be ended. There'd be no requisitioning. They would allow now the peasants to sell the surplus that they had produced on the free market. And yes, this was a, a backward step. It was a concession to capitalism, but there was no alternative. Just like the, in 1918 or late, late 1917, they were forced to give land to the peasants, which was a concession. So this was a further concession to the peasants, and yes, a move towards capitalist uh, uh, interests. But uh, Russia had been, been in, a, in a terrible position. 1920, 21, you had a terrible famine, particularly in the south, where, where, where even had instances of cannibalism being reported. So, so you see how, how desperate the situation had, had become. And what Lenin was afraid of by that time, because in effect you had a one-party state, the growth, of, the growth of alien bourgeois interests and alien ideas would penetrate into the, 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 the Bolshevik party, into the Communist Party. And therefore, they, he proposed extraordinary measures, temporary extraordinary measures, that is, that, that, they, that factions would be banned, and that included the workers' opposition, uh, but at the same time, held out a kind of uh, uh, fig leaf to the workers' opposition to come in and help them fight bureaucracy and, 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 uh, and so on. Now, such a measure to, to, to ban, in effect, factions, although that, it was applied in a very, uh, uh, um, how can I say, flexible manner, you'd say. Yeah. It's because of the enormous authority that Lenin had within the party. And he was, he was said, well, what happens if there's a big dispute? Well, what happens then? And Lenin said, of course, in those circumstances, there will be factions, there will be groups, obviously. In fact, within uh, 
yeah, within a year, just over a year, he had formed a block with Trotsky against uh, bureaucracy. So, he, so this, uh, because of, but obviously this had a, a dangerous precedent insofar as if Lenin wasn't around, how this, this uh, rule would be applied. And Lenin at this time become, becomes very, very concerned about the growth of bureaucratism within the state. These disputes are taking place, also begin to take place in, inside the leadership of the Bolshevik Party and the leadership of the Communist Party. For instance, over, over the monopoly of foreign trade, which, which was vital to maintain uh, uh, the, uh, the economy uh, against the dangers of, of cheap goods being, being brought in by the imperialists. <clears throat> Again, it, well, it was, it was Bukharin who, who proposed that they, uh, they weaken this, this, uh, this uh, monopoly. <clears throat> and, and Lenin was quite uh, blunt and said, you know, Comrade Bukharin is, is reflecting the material interests of the, of the peasants, of, of, the, of the rich peasants. And of course, the, the new economic policy, which gave concessions to the peasantry, resulted in a greater differentiation within the peasantry. And you have the growth of speculation in the towns, represented and reflected by what they called the net men. So this, by this time, you can imagine, the working class is very exhausted, ex exhausted after going through all these, this, this, this terrible trial, if you like, of survival. Le the, the Bolsheviks and, and uh, the, the communist leaders tried to keep out the, the, the bureaucrats and the careerists from the party because they knew they'd use the party as a, as a stepping stone to their own careers. So yes, there was a series in, and even of purges in the party to get rid of alien elements who would, would uh, come into the party. But of course, the, the danger of bureaucracy was getting more and more urgent, more and more powerful, if you like. Uh, and uh, Lenin wrote articles, you know, that uh, in effect, you know, the Soviet regime, you know, you could scratch it at any point and you'd see the old Tsarist state machine underneath. You know, he, he referred to, uh, the que well, he raised the question of who's controlling whom? Uh, it was a, even a, a bourgeois group in exile who... Uh, who supported this move towards the new economic policy because that, they thought, was the road to counter-revolution. And Le Lenin pointed to these people and said, look, this is the real, genuine danger that we face, not the false promises of, of, of communists like, that are here, the, the, the deceit of communism. And the, they established a new uh, uh, organ to fight bureaucracy called Rabkin, the Workers and Peasants Inspectorate. But well, the person who put in charge of Rabkin was Stalin. And rather than clearing out bureaucracy, he used his position in order to foster bureaucracy and a clique around him. In 1922, Lenin suffers a series of, of strokes. His health declines. He uh, links up with Trotsky in relation to the dispute on uh, uh, the monopoly of foreign trade, for instance. He also has grown, grown alarmed with news of um, the way in which uh, Stalin and his cohorts are treating people in, in, in uh, Georgia, the Georgian Communist Party. Ten minutes left. But it, the fact that he, he was, he was uh, in ill health for a period of time, when he come, returns to um, his work in October 1922, he's shocked by what he sees around him and the growth of bureaucracy within the party. But this time, uh, a new uh, office is created, the Office of General Secretary. And uh, with the support of Zinoviev, Stalin is proposed as the General Secretary. The position of General Secretary is up to this point an administrative post, not a political post. Uh, Trotsky, wa uh, sorry, Lenin wasn't very happy with the proposal. In fact, he, he commented that this... Uh, this cook will prepare peppery dishes. But while Lenin was around, he'd have a firm grip on what should be done. But with Lenin's ill health, they then became, became a maneuvering behind the scenes of old Bolsheviks trying to line up for the leadership. And therefore you have the formation of what was later known as the triumvirate or the troika of Stalin, of Zinoviev and Kamenev the so-called old Bolsheviks, formed in order to keep Trotsky out of the leadership. And as I explained, Lenin, in, when he returned in October 1922, had a meeting with Trotsky. 
and asked, well, decided on organizing a political block between the two men against bureaucracy and against, in effect, Stalin. Uh, one month later is the, is the, is the last appearance of uh, Lenin in public with a, with a major speech. He has a seizure strokes in December, which paralyzes him. He loses the power of speech partially. But he's so alarmed by the situation, he has his secretaries to dictate what became known as the Testament. And this Testament was a, an appraisal of key Bolshevik figures. And above all, he identified the dangers of a split in the party between Trotsky and Stalin. He, uh, he, he praises Trotsky, although says he has a, a, a leaning towards the administra administrative things, but warns that uh, Stalin has accumulated great powers in his hands and that uh, the idea is, it emerges that he should be removed from this particular position. But at this time now, everything un unravels because Lenin has a further st stroke in, in January 23. He, he had made promises to support the Georgian opposition, which had clashed with Stalin. His secretaries had reported, uh, although he was ill in bed, he was preparing a, a, a bombshell for the, for the coming Congress. Unfortunately, as we know, that uh, uh, Stalin was not able to deliver this, uh, sorry, that Lenin wasn't able to deliver this uh, bombshell. Because if Lenin and Trotsky had appeared before the, the Congress, then it would have been a, you know, an in, a force that they could not uh, deal with. They would have led to the, the removal and a big blow at the bureaucracy. As you're probably aware, that uh, Stalin abused Krupskaya personally because he, she dared to communicate with Lenin what was happening outside because Stalin tried to keep Lenin completely isolated when he was ill. So we see a, a rapid development in 23 then, uh, the consolidation of the triumvirate with Lenin out of the picture. Um, you had, on the, on the other hand, in 1923, the possibility of a victory of the revolution in Germany. But the German leaders who came to Moscow saw Stalin and Zinoviev who gave them the advice to go easy, go slow, don't provoke reaction. And the defeat of the German Revolution, you could say, sealed the fate of what was to, what was to happen. Just a few months later, in January, as you know, 1924, uh, Lenin dies. So the, the death of Lenin and the defeat of the German Revolution were an enormous blow against the morale of the Russian working class. And every defeat for the working class internationally strengthen the growing bureaucracy within the Soviet Union. Within a matter of months, Stalin comes forward with the theory of socialism in one country, which was a, a direct reflection of the interests of the bureaucracy who wanted a quiet life. It was an abandonment of the world revolution and the abandonment of Leninism. And the only person who stood up for the continuation of Lenin's ideas was Leon Trotsky, who formed the left opposition towards the end of 1923. This opens up a new chapter, of course, the chapter of the degeneration of the revolution, of the rise of Stalinism, the degeneration of the Communist International, defeat after defeat after defeat, which prepared the way for the Second World War. But for us, we have to um, learn, we have to study the period, the heroic period, where Lenin and the Bolsheviks fought to maintain the revolution and, and build for the world revolution. This is, an, again, an important chapter in our history. Thank you, comrades. So we will continue with the discussion now. There are a lot of comrades wanting to contribute to the discussion. I won't be able to bring all on. Um, and those who will speak, they get five minutes plus five minutes translation. The first one will be Charles, um, followed by Maral. Hi, comrades. Um, in October 1917, the Bolsheviks took power in the main Russian cities. But it was only the beginning of a struggle to build a united socialist federation in the old 
Tsarist Empire. In Ukraine, the Baltic states and areas of southern Russia, around the Don and in the Caucasus region, the bourgeoisie used nationalism and the former oppression by Tsarist Russia to fight socialist revolution. And these were to be acute zones of struggle for years to come. In this situation, Lenin insisted that Russian Bolsheviks act very carefully with the national minorities. In fact, the Bolsheviks would never have remained to power or even seized it without a right policy on the national question, i.e. the question of the oppression of certain nation and national minorities. Among all Marxists, it is Lenin who developed the most advanced reflection on the national question. In the Socialist Revolution and the Right of Nations to Self-Determination, he wrote, the aim of socialism is not only to abolish the present division of mankind into small states and all national isolation, but also uh, to merge them. Just as mankind can achieve the abolition of classes only by passing through the transition period of the dictatorship of the oppressed class, so mankind can achieve the inevitable merging of nations only by passing through the transition period of complete liberation of all the oppressed nations, i.e. their freedom to secede. And in order to achieve this aim, we must demand the liberation of the oppressed nations, not only in general nebulous phrases, not in empty declamations, not by postponing the question until socialism is established, but in a clearly and precisely formulated political program." End of quote. And that is what the Bolsheviks did from the beginning. Russia was a prison of the peoples. Georgians, Poles, Ukrainians, Finns, Jews, and many others were oppressed. Lenin advocated for the slogan of self-determination of nation as early as 1903. This could include the creation of an independent state with its own borders, administration, etc. Um, but advocating the right to separation does not mean advoc advocating separation itself. For Lenin, the right to self-determination was intended, intended to facilitate the union, voluntary union. Lenin, just a few days before the October insurrection, wrote, when we win power, we shall immediately and unconditionally recognize this right for Finland, the Ukraine, Armenia, and any other nationality oppressed by Tsarism and the great Russian bourgeoisie. On the other hand, we do not at all favor cessation. We want as vast a state, as close an alliance of the greatest possible number of nations." End of quote. Comrades, uh, this is of great importance because this position marks the difference between an internationalist policy and a reactionary nationalist policy. In fact, the right to separation is part of the struggle against separation. And, and actually, once in power, the national question was one of the main challenges the Bolsheviks faced. Like I said, Tsarist Russia was a prison of peoples. And the Bolsheviks offered self-determination self to many peoples, to Ukraine, for example. And one of the first acts of the Russian government, workers' government, was to recognize Finland's independence. Naturally, Marxists stand firmly for the unity of all peoples in a World Socialist Federation, but such unity cannot be brought about by force. Only by the free cons consent of the workers and peasants of the various countries. Above all, when the workers of a former imperialist nation take power, it is their bounden duty to respect the wishes of the peoples in the former colonies, even if they wish to secede. Unification can be brought about later on the basis of example and persuasion. Poland also gained its independence thanks to Bolshevik revolution, but I have no time to elaborate. I wanted to talk about Georgia also, but I, I have no time. <laughs> but the first years of the Soviet regime in Russia is full of lessons for us. But we are the only ones who understand and correctly use Lenin's program, we are the only ones carrying the rev revolutionary and internationalist program of the Bolsheviks. We are the true Leninists. We are the true communists. And we make no concessions to the great ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. 
and we know how to use these ideas in the present situation. When we'll take power, and comrades, we will, we'll have to deal with lots of national questions. Because modern capitalism is a system that is based on the specific operations of various nations and my, uh, national minorities. Sorry. So, so if you seek ideas, methods, and effective traditions to overthrow capitalism once and for all, and build world communism, you will find them in this organization, the Revolutionary Communist International. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, then Maral, and after Maral, um, we will have Franco. Uh, so among communists, it is well known that the uh, women in Russia played a leading role in the Russian Revolution, and that, the, and that the Russian Revolution was the greatest leap forward for women in history. So of course, when the workers state that they considered their own, that was their own, came under attack, uh, they fought to, de to defend it. And the first real attack, uh, as Rob explained, came with the railroad workers' strike just weeks after the insurrection. And the Central Committee met to discuss, should we give up power with the majority thinking, yes. For Lenin and Trotsky, the situation looked hopeless, but on the same week, uh, on November 6th, there was also a, another meeting happening, uh, the Petrograd Conference of Working Women. 80 delegates from across Russia representing 85,000 women workers were assembled and they wanted to know why do the Bolsheviks want to give up the power that we worked so hard to, to achieve. So they adopted a resolution demanding the Central Committee submit to party discipline and pursue a definite class line, a revolutionary class line. Uh, and they sent a delegation to the CC meeting to let the Central Committee know they were not happy with their conduct. At, at this time of crisis, this resolution had an impact, and Lenin would later say, in Petrograd, in Moscow, in cities and industrial centers, and out in the country, proletarian women have stood the test magnific magnificently in the revolution. Without them, we should not have won, or just barely won. That is my view. How brave they are, how brave they were, how brave they still are. Just imagine all the sufferings and privations that they bear, and they hold out because they want freedom and communism. When Russia was invaded by 21 imperialist armies just months later, uh, once again, the women question was not put on the back burner. It was not seen as an issue that only matters in good times or as a distraction from more important things. The Jeanne Adel, the, the Department for Organizing Women, was actually formed during the Civil War. Uh, Inessa Armand created flexible and democratic forms of organization modeled on the Soviets. The Jeanne Adel was used to mobilize women to support the civil war and to actively involve them in decision making and give them a vision of what kind of society they're fighting for. So while the country was under siege, uh, they held a, a, con a, a congress for women workers and expected only 300 delegates. But over a thousand showed up. Most of them had traveled hundreds, even thousands of kilometers. They arrived in army coats with bullet holes in them and some of them wearing symbolic red scarves. Because the Bolsheviks understood that the question of women's liberation and the question of winning any struggle of the entire working class are inseparably linked. Uh, so some ways that the Jeanne Adel, uh, served the war effort is that when the cities were starving and this was uh, threatening to declass the working class entirely with them fleeing to the countryside to eat and just dying en masse, uh, the women's commissions organized communal facilities to feed the cities. Uh, according to some estimates, over half of Petrograd and Moscow were being fed by these, uh, being fed communally. One aspect of the Civil War that's sometimes not seen when you read it in books is just the sheer mass of orphans created by the Civil War. There were over a million homeless, abandoned, and neglected children just wandering the streets. Sorry. And the Jeanne Adel organized the care of many of these orphans. But they didn't just organize women as women, they also encouraged women to defend the worker state like the men, men of their class as well, in whatever capacity. Because of the work of the Jeanne Odell, many women were inspired to join the Red Guards and the Red Army, in particular earning reputations as uh, machine gunners. They also formed the Red Sisters, uh, over 6,000 Bolshevik women medical students that were uh, serving the Red Army. So in, in practice, concretely, was demonstrated um, to women what role they play in this new state and to the entire working class, uh, the role that women should play in society. That the fight for communism and the fight for women's liberation are one and the same. Now, unfortunately, with the bureaucracy uh, taking hold of the state under Stalin's leadership, uh, there's a clear shift in the attitude. The bureaucracy was not interested in women's liberation or world revolution. 
They abolish the genodel, they ban abortion, they make divor divor divorces harder. Instead of working to free women from the nuclear family, they romanticize it. The nuclear family is now the uh, socialist family. It's the same oppressive institution with a red coat of paint. I, I don't remember the quote exactly, but Stalin says, uh, I feel bad for women who don't know the joys of motherhood. Our, our Soviet women, they are real women. They know the joys of motherhood. Now, of course, despite the degeneration of the Soviet Union, women were still better off in the Soviet Union than in the West because of the power of the planned economy. Um, but equality was never achieved and certainly not liberation. And this uh, vacuum was created uh, for the fight for liberation that was filled by identity politics. But that being said, those few first years of the Bolsheviks in power and the incredible strides forward made by Russian women in that period uh, under a worker state, under a real Marxist leadership, casting off their chains and fearlessly fighting side by side with the men of their class against their own op oppression and for the liberation of all of mankind shows the incredible possibilities uh, for the coming world communist revolution. Thank you, Maral. Um, the next speaker will be Franco, followed by um, Jamie. I, will, I would like to focus my intervention on art in the Soviet Republic and on the cultural policy of the Bolshevik Party. The social background of Russian artists and intellectuals was bourgeois or petty bourgeois. Their way of life was very different from that of the masses of workers and peasants who took power in 1917. At first, many artists were suspicious or hostile to Soviet power. The only group of artists who enthusiastically supported the revolution from, from the beginning were the futurists. The futurists rejected traditional art and sought new forms of expression. We wanted to revolutionize art. After the October Revolution, they found an ideal ground to experiment with new possibilities in all the arts. From the ranks of futurism came many of the best Russian artists in the 1920s. Uh, Mayakovsky, Malevich and Tatlin, Rodchenko, Meyerchold, Eisenstein. The People's uh, Commissariat for Education, aided by Lunacharsky, based its art policy on three priorities. To preserve artistic heritage of Russia from the destruction of the civil war, to make art accessible to the broad masses of workers and peasants, to open a dialogue with artists and intellectuals. The idea that uh, the Bolshevik government could uh, somehow direct the artistic life of the country from above uh, was completely absent. Lunacharsky entrusted many public commission to futurist artists, Mayakovsky, Tatlin, Meyerchold, held position in the departments of the People Commissariat for Education. But this was not a political decision. The futurists were simply the only artists who initially agreed to work with Lunacharsky. But there was a problem. The futurists demanded the abandonment and destruction of all revolutionary art, which in their eyes was nothing more than old junk to be got rid of. Just as the revolution had got rid, rid of the old society, the futurists also attacked all other artistic tendencies, claiming a kind of cultural monopoly. In the Bolshevik party, Bukharin, then still the leader of the party extreme left, sympathized with the positions of the futurists. However, on this point, Bukharin was in a small minority within the party. The rest of the Bolshevik leadership didn't want to destroy the old art, but to make it available to the masses in order to raise their cultural level. Lenin and Trotsky in particular were against to make the futurism the official uh, state art. The futurists were not the only talented artists active in the early years of Bolshevik power. As time went on, uh, a number of intellectuals, not revolutionary or Bolshevik sympathizers, tried to adapt to the new situation. They accepted the revolution and continued to work in the Soviet Union. Trotsky, Trotsky called them the literally, literary fellow travelers of the revolution. Among them were uh, great poets such as Ezenin and Bloch. There were also important pre-revolutionary artists who, who agreed to collaborate in some way with the Bolshevik regime. Chagall, 
Kandinsky, Stanislavski, Gorky. The Bolshevik regime refused to give state support to any single artistic group, but always remained impartial and tolerant between the various competing artistic movements, guaranteeing maximum uh, freedom of expression to all artists. Trotsky repeatedly defended the fellow travelers against the attacks by the futurists. Lunacharsky also worked with uh, conservative intellectuals to protect art collection and museums. Above all, Lunacharsky extended his support to artists of other tendency whenever the opportunity arose. Trotsky explained that the party can't give uh, orders to artists. The party cannot adopt the, po the positions of one literary circle against other literary circles. Thanks to this policy, not only art uh, flourished in Russia in the 1920s, but also the debate about art. A large number of associations and magazines were founded, supporting different positions and tendencies, and giving rise to a rich and passionate debate. Uh, Stalin rise to power also had a, a decisive impact on art. The artistic uh, vitality of the 1920s gave way to conformism and the police control of, of art by the regime. A regime art was imposed, the so-called socialist realism, which was neither realist nor socialist. Socialist realism was rhetorical and subservient to Stalinist propaganda. In the 1930s, the atmosphere in art and culture also became suffocating. Therefore, even in the field of um, artistic production, we see how the difference between Stalinism and Bolshevism was abysmal. Thank you. The October Revolution was carried out with the support of the mass of the people. And as such, it relied on relatively small guerrilla forces. It was able to sweep away the counter-revolution and even make small gains against Romania. As soon as it was faced with German imperialism, however, it totally collapsed. The task which confronted the Bolsheviks was trying to figure out how to create a new army to defend the revolution. The key debate, which Rob referred to, was over the principles along which this should, could be constructed. The military opposition tried to make a virtue out of the backwardsness of uh, the situation and said that small forces were something inherent to the, the proletarian revolution. Trotsky launched a vigorous campaign within the party to fight for a professional army. He said that because socialism had to be uh, built upon a higher basis than capitalist society, and that the revolution had taken place in Russia, which was a very backwards country, it was necessary to progress above the advancements which had been made by the, the previous state. Things which characterized the guerrillas, such as total freedom of internal debate, would be totally disastrous if implemented on a large scale. If every unit of the army can vote on whether or not it wants to carry out orders, then it's impossible to create a centralized plan. So too, if the commanding officers are just elected by the soldiers, then there's no way that people with military expertise will be able to, uh, to achieve tactical or strategic success. The concrete measures which Trotsky proposed included the reintroduction of the death penalty, not just for the counter-revolutionaries, but also for layers of the army which were wavering or which just tried to desert. He even executed members of the Communist Party who were defaming the party in the eyes of the workers through their cowardice. And it was only thereby that the prestige of the party in the eyes of the masses was protected. So too, the Tsarist officers, as Rob mentioned, were brought back into the army. And they recognized that there was a great danger to this, but it was an unavoidable danger. Particularly amongst the lower ranking officers, the NCOs, you had people who weren't proletarians, but were petty bourgeois and could be won over to the revolution. Many of the greatest geniuses of the Red Army, such as Tukhachevsky, came out of this layer. What it amounted to was a defense of proletarian principles in organization above guerrilla tactics, which fundamentally came from the peasantry. It was a demonstration of the flexibility and the realism which a revolutionary party needs. They didn't get carried away by the old slogans of democracy, removal of officers, and so on, but they understood that those slogans had been correct precisely because it made the Tsarist army unable to wage war. And Trotsky was proven completely correct throughout the Civil War. Those armies which he personally oversaw, such as on the Eastern Front, which adopted these principles, were able to make uh, rapid gains against the counter-revolution, whereas those places such as in North Caucasia, where they resisted this, uh, as what they saw to be an imposition from the center, uh, those armies totally collapsed and uh, drew out the civil war for much longer than was necessary. In this, uh, despite the legends which would later be created, Stalin played a very pernicious role. 
the reason why we talk about the Tsaritsyn opposition rather than the military opposition in general is because Stalin was responsible for keeping it alive far longer than elsewhere in the country in that city. Stalin made a fetish out of organizational forms, thinking that he could just command and that the army would have to obey him no matter what. In the army in particular, because of the importance of a disciplined and a, um, a sort of a formal rigorous structure, it's very easy to fall into sort of Zinoviite methods. But what Trotsky always understood was the importance of basing that off of a political campaign within the, the rank and file. The army was obviously ultimately responsible to the Soviets, which were elected by the workers. But for that not to simply be a, a, formal, um, a formal change, it was necessary for every single unit of the army to embody the proletarian revolution. Trotsky borrowed the system of uh, political commissars from the French Revolution, and initially these played quite a basic role. You know, if the general tried to betray the soldiers, then the commissar would just shoot him. But over time, they started to develop responsibilities for political education, for cultivating a communist cell within each unit and ultimately to play the role in each unit of the army which Trotsky was playing on a national level. It was only through the tireless work of all of the best cadres of the Communist Party that the desire for peace, which had been totally rampant in 1917, could be turned towards waging a revolutionary civil war. The party was absolutely fundamental in that process, which shows the importance of building the Revolutionary Party, not just to take power, but also to lead the transition to communist society. Thank you, Jamie. Then the next speaker will be Thomas, followed by um, Joey. Oh, uh, Thomas from the British section. Cool. Hopefully my tablet doesn't run out of charge. Um, so, yeah, I would like to also add on to the uh, question of the Russian civil war and answer the question of how did the Bolsheviks controlling just Moscow and St. Petersburg manage to fight back against the whites who were backed by 21 foreign imperialist armies? These imperialist powers had organized a major invasion. The Allied invasion led by the British involved tens of thousands of uh, British troops, Canadians, Australians and Americans. They used aircraft, tanks, poison gas and even ski battalions on the ice. And yeah, the military tactics of Trotsky played a role as we heard about. But what was decisive was the political arguments and the international backing of the working class. In Britain, the ruling class recognized this, and they were trying to deny an invasion was even taking place. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister at the time, said it is hardly the business of great powers to intervene in either lending financial support to one side or the other. Meanwhile, he'd sent uh, 10,000 British troops into the Soviet Union. And he would even write in his memoirs that if the workers had known he'd sent Churchill to Paris to organize the invasion, there would be a revolution in Britain. And, the, and these were not just idle words, for as soon as news got out, the Hands Off Russia campaign was organized. 350 delegates met in London, and they pledged to organize a general strike until the invasion was stopped. London dockers refused to load the Jolly George ship with armaments heading to Poland, and cap... Oh, and councils of action were organized up and down the country in order to uh, stop the invasion. Mean, uh, meanwhile, on the uh, domestic front, uh, meanwhile, back in Russia, you had massive insubordination of the troops. British troops ref uh, refused to uh, fire on uh, Russian uh, workers. And an entire French company would uh, even uh, mutiny. It was this level... It was this level of insubordination which uh, ultimately would force the Allies to withdraw. The first weapon that the Bolsheviks had was trying to win over and fraternize with both the imperialist troops and the peasantry being conscripted into the White Army. And sometimes comrades ask, how are, in, if there's a revolution and a counter-revolution that follows, what is our weapon that we are going to use to fight it? And the lesson of the defeat of the British invasion clearly shows that under the right conditions, the revolutionary paper can, <laughs> can be mightier than the sword. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Um, the next speaker will be Joe from the British section, followed by, yeah, we have time, Nelson, also from the British section. Yeah, and he will be the last speaker. Thank you. The bourgeois historian E.H. Carr pointed out that the Bolsheviks, and I quote, 
did not so much create new forms of government, but registered and regularised, so broadened out, generalised, those forms which were in the course of being established in the revolutionary upheaval. So, in other words, they did not impose abstracted ideas or organisations onto the working class, but they took what was given by the development of the revolution and of the working class to themselves. But we should also go further and explain that they took what was given by the development of capitalism itself. This is the materialist method the su of scientific socialism. The first example is the banks. Expropriation of the banks was carried out with immediate effect to begin the socialist planning of society as a tool of the workers' democratic organs. As Lenin said, capitalism has created an accounting apparatus in the shape of the banks. Without big banks, socialism would be impossible. He said the big banks are the state apparatus and could constitute as much as nine-tenths of the socialist apparatus. A single state bank, the biggest of the big, with branches in every rural district, in every factory, etc. You, you, you get the point. However, uh, in a similar method, required different uh, concrete approach to the question of the land. As Rob explained, the land was nationalised all in one go. But Lenin recognised that the state apparatus was too slim, too skeletal, to wield it centrally. Also, the mode of production on the land was too low. So in his decree on land, Lenin said, uh, this is simply a decree. Russia is vast and local conditions vary. We trust that the peasants themselves will be able to solve the problem correctly, better than we could do it. Also with industry, that which was uh, ready to be centrally planned was expropriated. But light industry was scattered in, in, and also in small workshops or even handicraft. The state could not wield it. This is in marked contrast to Stalin's forced collectivization, marked contrast to Mao's rural Soviets imposed on the peasantry to some extent, or the most absurd example of all of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, who abolished money and declared it to be the year zero. They emptied the cities and plan to rebuild society from the bottom up in the countryside. This is insanity and cannot be further removed from Marxism. The final example I want to give is uh, on the trade unions, which has already been mentioned. Lenin argued against other Bolsheviks, including Trotsky, on the statization of the trade unions. Trotsky thought that the leadership of the unions was a bit bureaucratic, which perhaps it was. But Lenin said to, to statize them would be a bureaucratic counter maneuver. In 1921, uh, the, trade, the, the Communist Party had around 500,000 members, half a million, whereas the trade unions had a membership of 6,900,000, almost 7 million members. Lenin therefore recognised that these workers' organisations, independent of the party and the state, were a huge uh, arena for the masses where the Bolshevik uh, wing could patiently work within to win support for their ideas, their policies, their philosophy. These were perfect schools of communism if they could uh, wage their ideas correctly. I'll quote Lenin on this. At the present moment, the trade unions are already fulfilling certain functions on behalf of the state. The working out of pay scales, the distribution of work clothing and equipment, etc. This is good and should gradually be increased. But any attempt to artificially accelerate this conversion would not improve the situation. The task is to win over the mass of these non-party organisations while leaving their character as organisations open to workers of various political views and attitudes. The literate, the illiterate, the religious, the non-religious. This puts to bed the absolute slander against Lenin and the Bolsheviks that they wanted to control the masses tightly and impose party rule over them dogmatically. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the last speaker will be Nelson. 
Comrades, uh, the Bolsheviks are presented as ruthless and uh, un- authoritarian while they were in power. They're accused of monopolizing all areas of Soviet life. This could not be further from the truth. In reality, the Bolsheviks showed incredible tolerance and restraint, even in the face of extreme sabotage from the petty bourgeois, which they experienced from the very first day of carrying out the revolution. I want to talk about the Bolsheviks' treatment of prolet cult. Prolet cult. Prolet cult, yeah. Prolet cult was a mass artistic organization that aimed to create an independent proletarian culture at the expense of what they called bourgeois culture, which for them was just all of the culture of the past. I'll explain why this idea was correct shortly. Prolet cult was founded in 1917 in Petrograd in Moscow. The leader of Moscow prolet cult was Bogdanov, the ex-Bolshevik petty bourgeois who Lenin polemicized against in materialism and imperio criticism. Many genuinely talented artists uh, belonged to prolet cult and emerged through its ranks. For example, Sergei Eisenstein was a theater designer for the Moscow prolet cult. Many other honest and genuine Bolsheviks were members of prolet cult, But with that said, once it was formed, it immediately became a hub for petty bourgeois intellectuals. Who, as Trotsky described, were really conservatives masquerading as radicals. Contrary to its projected image, prolet cult was never a genuine proletarian organization. Comrade Franco has already explained very well prolet cult's unifying idea that artistic forms inherited from pre-revolutionary Russia were bourgeois. And instead, proletarian culture should be created by the masses who are still, by the way, overwhelmingly backwards and uneducated at this point. The idea of so-called proletarian culture was originally a, a viperiodist idea, Bogdanov's group. It came from Bogdanov's anti-Leninist and anti-materialist faction. Lunacharsky was himself actually a member of Bogdanov's faction prior to rejoining the Bolsheviks. And prior to him becoming the head of the Commissariat of the Enlightenment. Prolet cult was one of the many different cultural organizations that did organically emerge after the revolution. But Bogdanov saw an opportunity within prolet cult to promote himself. As Franco said, for a short while, prolet cult was one of the only organizations willing to support the Bolsheviks. The other artists and intellectuals almost exclusively boycotted the new government. And so at first the Bolsheviks actually gave very generous funding to prolet cult in 1918. And this was despite Bogdanov's history and Lenin and Trotsky's disagreement with the idea of proletarian culture. In 1919, Lenin appealed to prolet cult to help raise the cultural and literacy, uh, the cultural level and literacy of the Russian masses, rather than distracting themselves with attempts at artificially creating a new culture. Lenin also wanted the prolet cult to try and bring more workers into government administration. Uh, and of course they ignored him. Lunacharsky, to his credit, even as a former Bogdanov supporter and a personal supporter of the idea of proletarian culture, argued that they would be better off nurturing new artistic talent in Russia. As Trotsky explains, the idea of the proletariat breaking with the culture of the past has no meaning. First, the proletariat must absorb thousands of years of great culture, internalize it, and then break with it organically on their own terms. Each new rising class places itself on the shoulders of the preceding one. 
So despite all this, the Bolsheviks did not try to shut down Prolikult immediately. They tried to separate its functions, giving um, the, uh, the Narkomfros, the, ed the Commissariat of the Enlightenment, the educational function and giving Prolikult a cultural function. But this wasn't enough for them. Prolikult, especially the Moscow section led by Bogdanov, wanted increasing autonomy and independence. I don't have time to go into all of the criticisms, but Krupskaya, Lenin and Trotsky were all correct in their assessment of Prolikult and its flaws. And still they were flexible and appealed to Prolikult politically. They only subordinated Prolikult to the government when Prolikult tried to monopolize all of the artistic creation of the worker state. And once they actively started disobeying the orders of the um, Bolshevik government. The Bolsheviks only ever encouraged and supported the artistic avant-garde, even prolet cult. And if you look at the legacy uh, of the Bolshevik government uh, and of the Ministry of Education, they consistently refused to call uh, to carry out a so-called cultural October from above. Their legacy was one of tolerance in the arts, science and education. And it's amazing what they and the great artists managed to achieve um, in these terrible conditions. Um, thank you, Nelson, and thank you all the comrades who contributed to this wide-ranging discussion. And I, and, I, and I also want to apologize to all the comrades who could not come in. So now Rob will sum up the discussion. Well, uh, I agree it's been a very wide-ranging discussion and, and reflects the, the nature of the subject. Uh, Lenin was very fond of using the phrase, um, theory is grey, my friend, but the tree of life is evergreen. In other words, you have your, your, the programme, but then you have to understand how to apply that programme to the living reality of the time. And of course, uh, the battle to survive in uh, Russia was a formidable one against conditions which we would find uh, unimaginable. Not only, did, not only was the you know, starvation, the disintegration of the working class, I did, I did mention that the, the, the epidemics which were, were uh, widespread throughout Russia as a result of these conditions, you know, of cholera, typhoid, yellow fever, which literally killed millions. So you have to, you know, understand uh, what, what they faced. I mean, to create a, a worker state under these conditions, uh, it was, it was imp uh, almost an impossible task, isn't it? Ideally, you, you, you know, you, you want the full participation of the working class in the running of society, of industry, of everything. But of course, the, the prerequisite of that uh, is you need to reduce the hours of work to allow people to, to have the time to participate. And, and the, one of the first decrees in, in, in uh, Russia of the, of the Bolshevik was, uh, was to introduce a, the eight-hour day. In fact, uh, also in the, in, the, in the message that uh, Lenin gave to the... Uh, Bavarian so uh, 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 revolution, the Bavarian Soviet, the first thing you should do is, is introduce a seven-hour working day. Uh, th this was essential. But, but in Russia, because of the civil war and the conditions they were under, workers were working 10, 12, 14 hours a day, not eight. And those are the objective conditions why the working class couldn't fully participate in any way. Um, and that the only way out of those circumstances, the only way out would be the extension of the revolution to the West. Uh, but, but Lenin, of course, was a, a realist, a revolutionary realist. He, he had a, an iron determination and uh, he was asked, uh, I think, by, by Trotsky, well, what, would, what do you think would happen if we, if we lost Petrograd and, and Moscow? What, we, what would we do? And he said, well, if necessary, we'll retreat, re, we'll retreat to the Urals and beyond. We would, we would regroup and eventually we'll, we'll move, we'll, we'll go on the offensive again, which showed the enormous, uh, I mean, courage, not just the theoretical, but the courage of the man in, de in determined to hold on to the victory as far as they possibly can, could. And uh, of course, the, despite these difficulties, these enormous difficulties, as was said earlier, that uh, you know, there were genuine attempts at, at reforms in relation to women, for instance, to gain formal equality in society. 
decrees were introduced to, to, to give the child care, maternity benefits, whole series of reforms to assist. And of course, there is an attempt as well to, to introduce uh, communal kitchens. But of course, the, the civil war and, and the desperate situation was always cutting across these things. You know, it's true that free, there was free food given out in, in, in Petrograd and in, in, in Moscow. But uh, the, the plight of the people was, was desperate. You know, in, in, uh, in the winter of 1918, 1919, under freezing conditions, pe people were freezing to death. The transport system had com com folded, it com collapsed practically. The railway system, I think, I think uh, half the, the, the goods wagons were out of commission. 60% of locomotives were, were completely were, were, were scrapped. Which was, given that, look, Russia was such a vast country, this, this, this transport was vital for the economic, you know, uh, development of the country, or even the basics. But uh, people were so desperate, they, 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 first of all, in flat, they'd be ripping up the floorboards in order to burn them, to, to get some heat. In a tenement block, people would gather down on the basement where there was at least a, a stove. You know, for different, lots of families living together just to, to hold, to, for the warmth. And, and whole libraries disappeared because books were being burnt for fuel. And yet, despite all that, there was, yes, it, it was the beginnings of a cultural revolution in Russia. You know, the, uh, a campaign against illiteracy where 70% of the population were illiterate. You know, you know uh, hundreds of schools were set up and, and colleges and universities. Uh, books, despite the fact there was hardly any paper available, there was a shortage of paper. The policy of the government was to produce books classic books to be even given away free to workers to read. You know, the the theatres were opened up. So yeah, workers, for the first time in peasants, are going to see ballet, going to see you know, the arts, basically, culture, the first time. I, in, even in the Lenin book, it was getting so long, we had to, I had to cut out the stuff about culture, which is, uh, it's amazing what they, despite all the odds, what they tried to do to, to raise the level of the masses. Uh, I think we have to be careful in relation to the, the trade, the so-called trade union discussion in 1920, where it's, you know, uh, Trotsky is accused of trying to militarise the trade unions and so on. The whole debate was nothing to do with the trade unions, in reality. It was to do with the fact that, the, that war communism had, had compete, come to a complete impasse. And uh, Trotsky was, was uh, would be given the responsibility now onto, onto, onto the economic, National Economic Council, he was in favour at that time, which, which was a, a year before he was introduced, of a new economic policy. You know, war communism, that, that it was collapsing. It, was, it had its day, it finished. But uh, his proposal was turned down. And therefore, he said, well, if you're going to turn that proposal, the only way you're going to make this system work is apply it with even more strenuous, strenuous efforts, you know. Included an increase in the militarisation of labour. But that, because that was the only route, if you weren't going to take another route. But as we know, then they, they were forced to introduce the NEP because of the, uh, the revolt in the countryside, first and foremost. But uh, uh, I know was, uh, orphans were, were mentioned earlier. They might, what are you talking about? A million orphans because of the Civil War. And hundreds of thousands of these young kids with no families, no ties, were roaming the cities and the countryside, pillaging busily. You know... Right for criminal activity, of course, which added to the, added to the enormous instability that was taking place. So, the, so you can see that the, the, the I mean, this this super well. Someone said some mention about uh, the, we're all we're all human. You could say these efforts were superhuman. You could not ask more of Lenin and the Bolshevik leaders to preserve the revolution in time for the world revolution. But clear, you know. Time was against them. They were retreating. At each stage, they had to retreat as well because of the objective uh, uh, barriers, if you like, uh, which were erected. And therefore, the question of, of the world revolution became the most important question for Lenin. But that, in turn, then was linked to a ferocious fight against bureaucracy, which was choking the Russian Revolution. It seems, uh, I think, funny for some comments. Well, why the hell did he put Lenin? It would put to put Stalin in charge of. Uh, you know, Rabkin, you know, the, the, the body's going to root out bureaucracy. And it's easy for us to look back, you know, and, and say, oh, yeah, look at that, yeah, look at that, come on. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, 
when personnel were being completely stretched because of the war effort in particular, every quality of every individual was assessed in order to how that could be used for the benefit of the revolution. And you know, politically, you know, Stalin was, was a non-entity politically, but he, he had a very firm character and he was well known for an ability to pl apply pressure and these and the conditions that we describe in here applying pressure was absolutely necessary in certain factors otherwise it would lead to enormous difficulties but clearly uh, um, he used it stalin used it and was reflecting more the pressures now because of its whole position of, of, of this bureaucratic uh, uh, um, backlash against the revolution Obviously, in an advanced industrial country, there wouldn't have been Stalinism. There wouldn't have been this, 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 these major problems. You know, if, if the revolution had been victorious in Germany, for instance, which was entirely possible. They had the biggest communist body in the world. Then they would have had an advanced working class, cultured working class, extremely advanced uh, technique and industry at their disposal, at the, at the center of Europe, would have transformed the entire situation. And uh, none of these objective difficulties that exist in Russia would have existed at that time then. So it all, it all came down to this, this question of, of, the, of the, the development of the productive forces. You know, and, the, and all they tried to do in, in Russia was just to develop as far as they could, but under colossal disadvantages that they'd never experienced, never thought of before. You know, there's this tiny handful of workers, three million workers against the entire might of world imperialism. The fact they could last five years under Lenin was a miracle. And yes, it showed, it. first of all, the, the, those workers in Russia were prepared to sacrifice everything, including their lives for the revolution. And of course, the international support of the working class everywhere else. You know, we can be inspired by this, this heroism, in effect. And we can see how, rather than a backward country like Russia, once you have a revolution in an advanced industrial country, how different it would be. And therefore, we must educate our comrades and, and fight against the slanders, yes, of the bourgeois historians and also the, the, the twists of the Stalinists, too. To, d to defend the great struggle of Lenin and the Bolsheviks in these years because they were fighting for the future. They were fighting for us. As I said earlier, Lenin didn't know how long it was going to last. They were putting down the, the decrees and so for the future. This is what we can do, mark us for the future. And this is what it represents for us. With all the weaknesses, with all the difficulties, the power of the working class to change society, to take history into their hands. And therefore, it's essential, yes, as, as a genuine communist, we have to learn the lessons from that period. And of course, this has been, how can I say, uh, hopefully this, this has served to whet your appetite a bit more then, to go into this, this question further. We can only skim over the surface here. And of course, it gives me the opportunity to plug a nice little book here. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I understand uh, for you anyway, they've been sold out. We sold out of copies. But <laughs> in fact, I had to borrow this because I left mine at home. So this is for sale, the only one here. <laughs> Anyway, comrades, I think it's been a, a very good uh, session. It augurs well for the future. Forward to the revolution. <laughs>